Hey, welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. Happy to have you back. It's a beautiful week in the fall here in Los Angeles. Last night was the first time since, I guess, probably May that we closed our windows to go to sleep and uh, snuggled under the covers, threw a move on the wife, got shut down, listened to an audiobook. Hey, you know, sometimes, sometimes the history of uh, Vladimir Lenin is just as exciting in your ears as you go to sleep. You know, I go to sleep uh, every night and I listen to audiobooks and I, they're biographies, historical biographies. I guess all biographies are historical, right? But I mean, deep history, right? Right now I'm on a, um, a Russia kick. I just I listen to um, Stalin's biography and Trotsky's biography, and now I'm listening to Lenin's biography. Anyway, so I remember none of it. That's the crazy thing. Is I saw my friend Brian Kiley the other night, and Chris Gorbos, who runs the West Side Comedy Theater, great fucking club. If you're ever in Santa Monica, and uh, and we're talking about books we've read, and I'm like, yeah, I'm reading this book about Lenin. Really? How is it? What's it about? Um, he, uh, he was poor growing up. Uh, he was rich growing up. Um, I can't remember. It's pathetic. And I just realized like so much of my brain, for, if, like, obviously I'm tired going to sleep, but I had a guy come up to me at the comedy store the other night and he was like, Greg. And I turn around and I'm like, don't recognize this guy at all. And he's like, uh, Hey man, we got to get the, the 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 golf team back together, and so I'm like a detective. I'm like, okay, I played golf with this guy at some point, and then I was like, and then he looks at my face, and he can tell I'm fucking lost, and he's like, with Richie, who manages the comedy store, and I'm still nothing, fucking zero, and it's just I don't I I ha I struggle with facial recognition like really bad, like I. We'll work with somebody for an entire weekend, and then a few months later, I'll run into them, like maybe they come to LA, and I don't remember their face. And it's not like I'm an asshole. It's not that I don't care. I truly care, and I try, but I can't fucking do it. I have ADHD, and it I struggle just getting things done. Ask my poor producer. Beth Hoops at, Bid, at Midcoast Media. I'm always late. I'm disorganized. And Beth, I am sorry. I want to apologize to everybody in my life. I am late and it's not that I'm being a douche. I just really fucking struggle. I have my whole life in school. That's why I don't have a job. I never had a fucking job. You think I can hold down a job with this brain? The only thing I can do is sling jokes and bullshit on a podcast. That's all I'm good for. Um, I think I pulled off the family thing because I just forced myself to be present with my kids. But I can't be that way for long. I can do it in bursts. And then I just check out. And I nod off. And I don't do the thing that's most important to do. My priorities are fucked because I'm lost. And, uh, and I try, I'm on Adderall right now. I read books. I keep a tight calendar. I've got my bag with, I could, I could talk to you about 10 minutes about how my bag is organized so that every time I leave the house, it's with me and I have everything, but, uh, but I still, I still come up short. So, um, anyway, so this, this guy, this guy was, I think hurt. I think I hurt. I've hurt a lot of people. People take it very personally when you don't remember them. And uh, it's just such, I, I look at some people like with perfect memories and I'm so jealous. Their life must be so much easier. But anyway, enough about that. I had a nice day yesterday, me and the wife and the daughter, Josephine Rose, drove down to San Juan Capistrano, which is maybe my favorite town in California. If you're ever in LA and you wanna drive an hour south, it is just mad. It's this magic little town. It's got a cute village, and it's got like uh, these little cabanas you can rent. And there's these just tons of antique shops and 
just everything is adorable. There's a there's a tea house where people where women show up in gloves and they dress up and they have proper tea. And there's uh, this outdoor garden shop with all these cool like uh, kind of Day of the Dead decorations. Lots of Halloween stuff. Uh, but it's a joyous, wonderful little town. And they have a thing where the swallows come every year. And they travel from, I looked it up because I didn't know the whole history. But apparently uh, yesterday was uh, the day, October, I'm taping this on the 24th. On October 23rd is the day they generally leave San Juan Capistrano. These swallows show up and they migrate from fucking Argentina. And they fly all the way up, uh, and the, the, the northernmost point is San Juan Capistrano, and then they just chill out, all these beautiful um, swallows. But I guess, I, I don't know if we missed them or not. I literally did not realize we were there on the day that annually they leave, or we would have gone to the park where they go to. But anyway, it's they, there was like an old mission. I guess it's got, I mean, there's a dark history. The missions are never happy places. You don't want to be in a mission. Here's the mission. Fucking whip you. That's the mission. And uh, they have a parade, which we missed. But we we had a lovely day. Um, and I was reading that the Swallows did not come to San Juan Capistrano from 2009 to 2017 because they went just north to Chino Hills um, because uh, of gang activity. No, because it wasn't the tallest building in the area any longer because of urban sprawl. And so to attract them back, they built swallow nests and I guess they put up some towers and made it taller again and they came back. It worked. We fucked with nature. Um, and so uh, anyway, we had a really nice time and I just just got in the car and did it. And I just got a, I just had a nice time with my wife and daughter. They were shopping together, and my daughter's so wonderful and so beautiful and so special. Um, came home, and then uh, if you follow me on Instagram, I posted my uh, neighborhood watch or what do they, what do they call it? Um, wait, I gotta look it up on my phone. The next door app, you know, the next door app where the neighbors all rat on each other and talk about what's going on in the neighborhood. So I uh, I posted something that a lot of people commented on. Here's here's the headline on a sun on a beautiful Sunday evening. Here's my my next door neighbor app. Um, uh, today a man masturbated into my front yard flower bed. I did not call the police. I wept. She wept. How do we get here? Remember that we elect our representatives. <laughs> and it gets political. A guy jerking off on our roses suddenly becomes about politics. Uh, I mean, I guess if you think that politicians are encouraging homeless people to masturbate in your garden, I don't know. Um, and below that, the flash mob kids are out again. Uh, 30 kids came into Dinah's and started stealing stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what your neighborhood... Ne I, I put my next-door neighborhood app in Venice against anybody's in terms of fun shit that happens. Um, and jerking off on a garden, you got to think, you always want to stop and smell the roses. But to actually stop and jerk off on the roses, that's embracing life. Some people get... I get a special feeling when I smell a rose. So, um, but that's the thing about Venice is it's a very mixed place. There are uber wealthy people. I mean, I could sit here and name A-list celebrities that live in my neighborhood. And I can also tell you that I sometimes have a guy living in his car behind my house and I have people laying in the alley sometimes. Um, and it's the richest and it's the poorest in L.A., living right up against each other. Like when I, with the, the place where the public course we play golf in Venice is called Penmar, and it's next to the Santa Monica Airport. So as you're playing golf, and they've since cleaned it up, but for a long time, the first two holes, so like close to a mile of 
homeless encampments along a fence along the border of the golf course and people living and cooking and cleaning and shitting along the golf course. And then above your head are these, you know, $20 million Lear jets flying above you. So you're being distracted by you're, you're, you're yelling at the millionaires and then you're yelling at the homeless guy who's taking your golf ball. And they're just pressed up right against each other. And we go to uh, we do a yoga class on Sunday mornings on the beach, and I think I might have told this story, but we were doing it, and and it's always, it's always like you know it's these precious West Side liberals that show up, and they've got on fancy yoga clothes, and they're very peaceful, and they're very loving, and I'm not shitting on the class; it's lovely. It's a it's a, we splurge on ourselves and do something kind of precious once a week, and do this yoga on the beach thing. And, uh, and then, but there's always homeless people that are waking up on the beach as we're starting, they're waking up and they wander around and they talk to themselves and they sometimes yell at us just random shit. Like I'm going to, I'm going to remember one guy screaming, I'm going to milk your tits while the lady was in the down dog position. And, um, and the, and the instructor just always says, stay on your mat, keep your mind on your mat. It's part of our focus. Almost like we're doing, almost like the, that this is helping our practice. Um, and then one time a guy stole, a guy stole this woman's Uggs and he was running down the beach with her Uggs and she started chasing him. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Are you going to tackle him? Get back on your mat. Stay on your mat. You'll walk home barefoot. And let that, let that homeless dude cram his big feet into your little Uggs and walk around town. Shh. Is it, and these, and and rich people give their tents to the poor people as a way of like trying to help them. And now there's like these twelve hundred dollar REI tents that have fucking solar panels, so you can charge your your cell phone. Uh, it's like it's nicer than the guy's apartment that he used to live in. And uh, and I don't know what the answer. I don't know what the answer is. It's uh, it's it's something we struggle with in Venice, but. You know, you help out. We we serve at a soup kitchen in Santa Monica. You try to maybe throw them some money or buy people some food on the street. Look them in the eye, treat them with dignity, and hope that somehow um, the housing situation changes. I think that's at the root of it, is that ha- housing has just become more and more unaffordable to people. And they just don't have a place to live. So they're on the street. So I think they got to build more affordable housing, but I don't know that we'll ever catch up. There's so many homeless now. I think there's 60,000 people a night. Is that fucking crazy? Sleep on the streets in LA? I should check that number before somebody corrects me. But I'm pretty sure it's 60,000. How many homeless in LA? Um... 69,000. I shot low. Jesus Christ. It's fucking crazy. Anyway, people had very strong feelings about this post. I got tons of comments. And some some people, of course, well, are you happy now, you fucking liberal? Yeah, I am. This was what this was my dream. Stepping in human shit when I'm walking my dog in the morning. Yeah, this is my dream. Um and then, oh, this was in the news. Another fucking Walgreens worker. There's this thing going on at Walgreens where Christians work there and they are empowered by the management and the owners of Walgreens to make moral decisions on what they will sell to customers. Let me break it down for you. Women are walking up to the counter with plan Bs or condoms and the cashier is saying, I'm sorry, I won't sell those to you. It's against my moral principles. So they make a big fucking scene, and then a manager has to come over and check the person out while the line of people now knows that they're fucking in the early stages of pregnancy, that they had a wild night the night before. They got a bottle of aspirin and a plan B and some handy wipes and some, and some prep H for the anus. They had a wild night. Um, and I just think, you know, 
You're, you work at fucking Walgreens. It's not a health food store. If you want to, if you want some place with more, go go work at that mattress store that that guy uh, owns. You know, if if you're ringing up a guy and it's like, okay, uh, carton of carton of Parliaments, got it. Ninety per cassette, got it. A half guy, a half gallon of sh- fucking rot gut vodka in a plastic bottle, swiped it. Oh, Plan B, nope. Not good for you. If a woman is, if a woman's got the cigarettes and the Percocet and the vodka, uh, maybe give her the Plan B. Maybe that baby's not gonna come into the greatest circumstances. That might be a good pass. That's that baby's a hard pass. That would, that's what I would call my my abortion clinic if I opened one. Hard pass. Um. And you know, speaking of. And then, like, lottery tickets. Um, I was, there's an article in the New Yorker this week about the lottery. I was just fascinated by the history of the lottery. It goes back, literally goes back to, like, ancient Rome. Those were the first lotteries. And they did it as a way to not have to raise taxes. And I have no idea how you organize a fucking lottery in, you know, 1 AD. But... They did, and they 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 were fucking huge, and they did it all through history. Every culture has run these lotteries. Because here's the thing: if you're a politician and you want to raise taxes, you're not going to get elected. If you're a politician and you want to cut services, you're not going to get elected. So what they do is they 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 promise people they'll raise money with a lottery, and the article tracks about how little of the money actually ends up in the state coffers. And that the company, there's, I, should, I should have written the name of the company, but the company that has been running state lotteries, and they've done it very in a very corrupt manner, they've got huge lobbying efforts, and they pulled a couple of fast ones so that they have a monopoly on all the uh, state lotteries. They take all the money. It's all going to them. A fucking small percentage ends up helping out. In, 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 like, like It ends up covering like half of 1% of the education budget. And it really comes out of the poorest pockets. Poor people play the lottery. Rich people understand that the odds are remarkably small and they don't play. So the poor are just getting taxed harder, essentially, because the whatever, whatever. I got ADHD. Let me focus on my own issues. Uh, One quick overheard, and then we'll get to my guest. This comes from Tom Duda. Duda, Duda. I walked into the men's room at a breakfast restaurant on Sunday morning. There was a guy standing there waiting to use the stall. While I was using the urinal, the guy who was in the stall came out, and the guy who was waiting said to him, Damn, I might have to take my shirt off for this one. This is a little too much camaraderie for me to... First of all, I won't go into a stall that a guy has just been in. I don't want to sit on a warm seat. That feels a little too intimate. That feels a little bit too much like going ass to ass with a perfect stranger. Um, so I would I would take a pass and I would rush home. And, and, and nobody needs big comments. Nobody needs appreciate comment. This isn't NFL Thursday night. Just quietly going and shamefully shit. Shitting is shameful. It's not to be shared. I started to talk about a shit that I took on the golf course. I wasn't on, no. I was on the golf course and I started telling Gibbons and Gubbins about a shit I'd recently taken and they both stopped me. I mean, these are degenerate, low-life pieces of garbage and they stopped me from talking about it. Um, What's his name? Uh... The guy that wrote Unbearable Lightness of Being, Milan Kundura, once said that shit, they said, he said that bad art, kitsch, kitsch is defined as the denial of the existence of shit, and that all art must talk about shit. I mean, obviously, as a metaphor for, you know, the dark side, the dark things that we want to flush away and ignore. We need to talk about those. Like my ADHD. Anyway, if you want to hear me do stand-up comedy, oh, 
San Francisco Punchline. Tell your friends. Bring your family. November 3rd through the 5th. I will be at my second favorite club in the country. Side Splitters in Tampa, also an amazing club, November 17th to 19th. Then I will be in the Rodeo Cinema in Oklahoma City, December 1st. Hyenas in Fort Worth, Texas, December 2nd and 3rd. Come on out. Get the tickets at fitzdog.com. Also on the site, you can get yourself a uh, Grapefruit Simmons t-shirt. Sign up for the premium membership, which actually gets you in to shows for free. If you get the $19 membership, and if you crunch the numbers, this is kind of crazy not to get the uh, premium membership, you will get uh, 970 back episodes of Fitz Dog Radio, and you will also get two free tickets to a show when I play in your town. You just email me, and I set it up. Nice deal, huh? Uh, all right, let's get to my guest. Oh, this guy's been on the show many times. He's a dear friend. I've known him many years. He is truly... One of the funniest human beings I've ever met in my life, on and off stage, and a great dude with a big heart. He's got a podcast called Hiking with Kevin, and he has a new book out called I Exaggerate, which we're going to talk about on the program. Um, and then you know him from Saturday Night Live, all the Happy Madison films, Weeds, Glenn Martin DDS, The Wedding Singer, Anger Management, Daddy Daycare. Aliens in the Attic. I mean, it just goes on and on. The Larry Sanders Show, the sitcom Still Standing, the sitcom Man with a Plan. The guy is one of the hardest working guys in show business for the last 40 years. So here he is, my friend, Kevin Nealon. My guest, uh, Kevin. Neilan, that's Neilan. Neilan is yeah. here. Capital N. Uh, Neilan is uh, what is that Irish? What do you that want? Is Irish, yeah, eighty-seven point one. Oh, that's Mick. right. You got your uh, you got passport. your Irish passport. That's correct. Yeah, I haven't used it yet. I'm that. afraid. Why? I'm afraid I won't get back into the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? I would take both with me. Yeah. But then I'm afraid they'll look at it and say, why won't you stamp coming out of the U.S.? Right. And that's when I have to jump over the counter and start fighting the guy. <laughs> And that's when he knows you're Irish. That's right. <laughs> Take a break. We'll be right back. Um, yeah, that's about the size of it. But I'm yeah. excited about that. Yeah. And I told you where I come from in Ireland, my, my ancestors. Mayo? No. County Clare. But oh, County a little Clare. town, out of all the towns, it's called Fecal. No, it's yeah, not. Yeah, I swear to God. F-E-C-A-L? F-E-C. But it's spelled differently. Yeah. But it smells the same. <laughs> I've been there. It's F-E-A-K-L-E. <laughs> In New Jersey has a lot of names like that. There's uh, uh, Me Touchin. Really? Yeah, Me Touchin. And there's, uh, I forget, when I used to work the Hell Rooms in New Jersey, I would, I, I had a whole routine about it. It's good when you have a go to a different town. Like at this point, you've been doing it for so many years. It's like if you go to St. Louis, yeah. you've got your arch jokes. If you go to Louisville, you got your bat jokes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, let, I'm going to give you a city and you give me the joke you do in that city. Okay, but first let me say that I used to go see these shows in my hometown of Bridgeport at this big theater. They were called like Ray Bradbury's vaudeville show or something. And yeah. they'd have jugglers. They'd have the harmonic cats there. I would love it. And then they would have a comic come out. And it was it was the guy, uh, who was the guy from F Troop, the, the captain with the gray hair? Oh. Uh, what's his name? He was a comic. Yeah. Yeah, I know who you're talking Larry about. Larry Storch would come out uh -huh. from F Troop. Um, and uh, uh, the Impressionist, he was the Joker on Batman. Fred, no, is it Fred? No, he was, um, he had a, he was, oh, I'm thinking of the, no, I'm thinking of the of Grandpa from the Munsters, because he was a comedian. Was he a comedian? Yeah. Um, but So you yeah. got all the top level talent. Top level, but they would always yeah. mention something in your town. Uh -huh. And the yeah. crowd would go crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, what is yeah, it with this yeah. uh, hot dog stand down on Main Street? Why is it so popular? It tastes like crap to me. Ah! You know? <laughs> when the Stones played, uh, I guess it was the L.A. Stadium, with Dodger Stadium, 
They said, uh, I'm glad you guys came out tonight because I know you have a lot of other options. You could be down at Brennan's watching the turtle races, <laughs> which is in Venice, this little it's Irish one of bar. Beach, too. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. And they have turtle races. Yeah. You yeah. need really small jockeys on there. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And they really have to be mellow because that really? thing is not going to kick for you in the stretch. It takes forever. Yeah. Man, I just heard a tortoise uh, rabbit joke a while ago. I remember thinking it was so funny, but I can't remember jokes to save my life. Um, I just heard a really good one. Um, this my my doctor told me that a kid came in and he was with his mother and he said to the doctor, he goes, "You want to hear a joke?" And the doctor goes, "Yeah, sure." And he goes, uh, "Okay, what do you what do you call uh, what do you call a cow with uh, three legs?" And he says, "What?" And he says, "Lean lean beef." And he said, "What do you call a?" a uh, a cow with no legs and he said ground beef and he said and what do you call uh, a cow with two legs and he said what he said your mama <laughs> and the mother started yelling at the kid during the appointment oh my gosh <laughs> Frank Sinatra was playing at the Universal Amphitheater once I went to see him near the end of his career really and he did the same thing with the naming the um, you know ten. Well, I came here tonight man whoa that Laurel Canyon man it's just <laughs> windy isn't it <laughs> <laughs> it's just a freebie. It's a free I, laugh. I that, it man. lets I, you feel like they, you're in the moment. All right, I'm going to give you some cities. I try Francisco. to do that when I'm driving in from the airport to the driveway. Yeah. What do people make fun of around here? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Right. And uh, one guy, I said to one place, I go, I, you kind of do the general ones, the vague ones, so I could do them in every city. Yeah. Like I if the really small towns, I go, uh, I asked my driver what I should not miss while I'm here. He goes, your airplane back home. <laughs> <laughs> your flight back home. You're working, I was looking at your tour dates, and you're working in Lowell, Arkansas, at a place that I just did about no. three weeks ago. Tell me that's not true. You're in Lowell, I Arkansas. I got to check my schedule. Yeah. I told me to just book me anywhere. And then they put me down south. <laughs> that's what happens. And it's the, it's the home headquarters of Walmart. Oh, now that changes. Things. So you do all Walmart jokes and they go crazy. Do you right have something I could take with me? Well, they call them Wall Martians. That's their nickname. Wall Martians. Yeah. And um, yeah, they go pretty nuts. But uh, all right, I'm going to give you some towns. Okay. You tell me your opening bit in that town. San Francisco. Uh, my driver on the way in, I asked him, what is it the best, uh, you know, what I, shouldn't I miss while I'm here? He goes, you flight home. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I know you were going to do that? I don't know. Um, you know, I, I do have a lot of general ones that I do. Yeah. Um, like, you know, people say there's nothing to do here in Sarah's, you know, in whatever town it is. I said, that's not true. There's a lot to do here. You know, you could go to Comstock. You could go to uh, Seattle. You could go anywhere, whatever the big cities are nearby. You go anywhere from here. <laughs> <laughs> but San Francisco, I guess you would make fun of what? Albert uh, um, Island and the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge? Well, if it was the 80s and you're Bobby Slayton, it's just gay jokes yeah. for an hour and a half. <laughs> um, I hate Ashbury, the hippies. And now you can kind of do that. Like, I was listening to, I like to listen to Sirius XM. You have Sirius XM, yeah. right? I know you like Howard Stern a lot. But they have the comedy channels right below Howard, 99 through 93. Yeah, yeah. What number are you? I'm number four. Are you really? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You're going to move up to number three, maybe? I'm hoping to get to number three. Who's number three? <laughs> number three is Jack uh, Jack Black. I didn't know he had a... Yeah. I didn't know he had one. Yeah. And who's number two? Um, Felicia Rashad. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. So I'm listening to old time uh, radio. 93. 93 is you. You're 93. You had to wait to <laughs> say available. it, didn't you? It's right? available for anybody <laughs> who wants to jump on the podcast. Um, so Jack Carter, do you remember Jack yes, Carter? He was one of the ones at the uh, Roy Bradbury. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thing, Jack he, Carter. Jack Carter was the first guy to have a late night talk show. People always think it was Jack Parr. No. What about... Joe Pine. Is that his name? Oh, really? Was there a guy before Jack In New Carter? New York. I think it was oh. Joe Pine or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was all out of New York. It was all the the whole TV and film industry was New York, and so Jack Carter was a big deal, and he was a great comic. But I, but they played a clip of him in San Francisco talking about the hippies, and it was so out of touch. Now it was so funny to hear what a guy who you think a comedian is being hip and progressive, and 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 the comedy back then was not comedy was the status quo. It was really like. What's with these kids, these yippies, these hippies with the yeah. hair, with the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's really changed a lot. It's still changing. Yeah, it is. You know, do, you, gotta... do you watch young comics and see what's going on? I try to. Yeah. In the clubs. It's hard for me to sit down and watch an hour special, although I'm yeah. forcing myself to do that to find out. And, you know, I don't want to change my... Um, my whole persona to try to keep up with that. Right. I think you just got to do what you do. Some Someone experienced once, I forget who it was, Mel Brooks or somebody, Carl Reiner said, you know, don't try to change. You know, just do your act and those ripples of your act will find the people out mm-hmm. there that connect with you. Yeah. But there's less and less of those people <laughs> nowadays that connect with you. Well, there's so many people touring. It's crazy. Touring and podcasts. Yeah. What is it with people that have podcasts? I don't know. It's kind of desperate, isn't <laughs> oh, it? Oh man, I'm telling you, it's you know, it's yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, comedy has changed in so many ways now. The only people that could have filled a big theater a while ago was Steve Martin, yeah, right, or right. maybe George Carlin. But uh-huh. now it's like, you know, it seems like it's very accessible now to a lot of people. There's 20, 25 people now that can fill stadiums, yeah. and then you've got. Like just the like when I listen to the Comedy Channel, like Eugene Merman comes on. You don't think about Eugene Merman, but guess what? Eugene Merman can tour the country, and he can do little. He does like little theaters, really little eight hundred seater seater theaters, which is a great living. If you can, there's so many Todd Barry, there's so many people that aren't playing stadiums but have a following because they have a podcast because they're on social media. It's beautiful. Like everybody finds their audience now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I you know, Jack Carter once, I was coming back from the Caribbean a long time ago, and a bunch of these guys get on my plane, and it's Jack Carter and a couple others, Larry, maybe Larry Storch? <laughs> I don't know. But they all come on the plane, and they recognize me, because I guess I was on SNL at the time. And uh, I said, what, what, are, you, are you guys going to do a tour? He goes, no, we do the condo circuit. And I thought, oh, how sad. Yeah. You know, it's the old people, their generation. Mm-hmm. And then I find out that these condo circuits have really nice big theaters, uh-huh. you know, and they make pretty good money. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more and more about it as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad yeah. after all. I'm going to do the Airbnb circuit. <laughs> um. No, you should go do the, uh, what's the other one, the next step up? Co- co-ops? No, no, from the Airbnb. It's the... Um, Oh, it's a nicer Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. We just stayed in an Airbnb last week. I visited my my son in Chicago, and I did a theater. Oh, God, I got a th- place for you to play. It's called the Den Theater in Chicago. It's like maybe four or 500 seats, but it's like the greatest theater. Sam Morell just shot his Netflix special no there. Way. And the guy said, who would you recommend to come in? You'd be perfect for that place. I would. I usually do bigger theaters, but I wouldn't mind taking a look at it. No, but you could do like two shows. You like two shows, right? I could, I, I could, yeah. I'm gonna write that down. The Den Theater. You know, the I write theater. everything down now. I write down like movies that I want yeah. people recommend. Right. And not to watch them, just to write them down, pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> so, never seem to watch so we're in Chicago and we get an Airbnb and it looks fantastic from the inside. And we show up and we get out of the we get out of the uh, car, and I look up and we're at the subway station. The Belmont subway station on the elevated rail in Is that Chicago. Good? Bad. That's bad. Well, it's once loud. we get into the unit, we walk in and we open up the curtains and we are looking from me to you. There are people on the subway platform oh <laughs> looking my inside God. of our apartment and they all look at us like we were infringing on their privacy. Uh, <laughs> They're like, what are you doing looking at us? Uh, <laughs> you know, I go by, I, there's an exit, uh, Howard Hughes exit off the 405. Sure. And there's a new condo or apartment building there. And I'm telling you, it's right up against the exit. I mean, there's there's people with balconies, yeah, with their apartments just almost hanging over the freeway. And I think who yeah. would want to live there? Yeah, well, maybe they're into NASCAR racing or something, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if they play all those like game. You know, when you're on road trips and you play games like you, you know, looking for license plate numbers oh, yeah, and yeah. stuff. I wonder if they sit on the porch and play driving games or throw water balloons out. Yeah, 
Eggs. What's the worst apartment you ever lived in? It was the first apartment I had when I moved to California. Um, I moved to San Diego with a buddy of mine. We both went to the same college. We drove out to, to California in my grandfather's old Pontiac Grand Borough or something, whatever it's called. And it was on its last legs. And we get into San Diego and we just want to check out San Diego. So we're there in November and we don't know the areas of town. And we go to a place called North Park, which is nice now. But at the time, it was it was really unsafe and seedy. Yeah. And we found this apartment building and we go in there and it's a real ratty apartment, but it was cheap. So we rented that month by month. And I remember... I mean, it was, I don't think anybody spoke English around there, you know? Uh-huh. And we, we uh, it was Christmas time, and we both got jobs at the department store of Santa Claus's <laughs> through Manpower. <laughs> that was a temporary help agency. <laughs> Manpower? Manpower? I was 23 at the time. <laughs> I was probably the worst looking Santa Claus. I was thin. I had like a cotton beard. But they didn't spend any money on the suit. The pants were uh, scotch guarded because kids were so scared they'd pee on your lap. <laughs> and so Christmas, we set up, we got a little Christmas tree, and because you couldn't get Coors beer back in the East Coast at the time. Yeah. We would drink the Coors and we would hang each Coors as an ornament <laughs> on the tree. <laughs> that was the very worst apartment. How about you? Um, I had a uh, I had a place when I first moved to I, I was in New York. I was in this place for probably like seven years. And it was on Mulberry Street between oh. Prince and Spring. Oh, down in the village. Uh, yeah, Little Italy. Little Italy. The heart right. of Little Italy. As a matter of fact, uh, John Gotti's social club, the Ravenite social club, was literally downstairs and one door over. I walked by there a couple months ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I've it's seen different neighborhood now. Yeah, it's a little nicer now. But when I was there, I was on a sixth floor walk up. Six floors. Oh, wow. And uh, it was an old tenement building, so everything was shifted. It was just completely slanted. And so, like, if like if you dropped an apple on the ground, it would roll across the yeah. floor. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> we would shower, and there was a standing shower stall, and the drain was in the middle of the shower, and the water would build up on the edge, and it would flow over. So halfway through the shower, oh, you would have no. to kick the water <laughs> into the drain in the middle. <laughs> I've had homes like that. You know, the, home, the, the floors are so slanted. Even a banana would roll down. <laughs> See, this is what we do. You ask me about the worst apartment, and I ask you back what's yeah, the worst right. apartment. That's and right. that's a strategy my wife uses on me. She'll say, what is it What is it you don't uh, like about me? <laughs> it pulls you in, and then they'll say, well, here's what I don't like about you. <laughs> oh, there's nothing you don't like about Susan. No. She's an angel. It was it Ray Romano, I think, had a joke. He said, you know, my wife asked me, you know, who would you have in a threesome if you were going to do a threesome? If your wife ever asks you, make sure you include your wife in that threesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. David Feldman, you know David Feldman, right? Yeah. Great writer. And he had a joke. He says, uh, you know, you get a free hall pass. Every marriage is a hall pass, the person that you can step out with. Yeah. And he said, we got to be older. And, um, you know, originally my hall pass was Angelina Jolie and hers was Brad Pitt. And I said, can we, now that we're older, can we update the uh, the pass? And she goes, yeah. She goes, uh, she goes, who do you want it to be? And he goes, the babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> Here was my uh, hall pass joke. Yeah. Um, my wife and I have a hall pass. Uh, and, uh, but I realize you have to up, update your hall pass. You can't write somebody's name down on a piece of paper yeah. and stick it in the drawer and then pull it out 10 years later and think, you know, things aren't going to change. Uh-huh. I looked at mine, Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> my wife's, Bruce Jenner. <laughs> 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 oh, Caitlin! I'll tell you what, she got a great sense of humor. She did the roast, and they yeah, heard. they let her they let her roast her. They let she let them roast her. And uh, my friend was the head writer on the roast, and she came in the room. And usually, like they go over the jokes with the host, and they can say what what they. She was on board for everything. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a little run that I do on her. And I ran up by her, and she was laughing. Oh, no this shit. a couple years ago. Really? Yeah. I asked her if she would go on my hiking show. You know, I do hiking with yeah. Kevin on YouTube. Fourth season, premiering hey. October 27th. Congratulations. So I asked her, I said, Caitlin, would you want to do my hiking show? Because I knew Bruce Jenner. And I guess, you know, he had said some <laughs> nice things to her about me. <laughs> so she said yes. She said she would go. 
And I asked her, I, I, my favorite question to ask her was, Caitlin, if you could change one thing about yourself, <laughs> what would you change? <laughs> <laughs> but I had a whole riff on the idea of maybe having the, the um, gender reassignment, as she corrected me. It's not a sex change. It's gender reassignment. Uh-huh. And uh, if I would do that or not. Yeah. And I, I have a whole thing I do in my act about that. But, um, but yeah, she is game yeah. for a lot of stuff, man. She's from my uh, hometown. She grew up in Tarrytown, New York. I thought she, she was she, in Connecticut. No, I thought she was in. Um, I thought she was in Newtown, Connecticut. She might have moved there like halfway through high school, but she set all the records. There's all the records at the high school at Sleepy Hollow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Sleepy Hollow. What did you say? Sleepy Sleepy Hollow. Oh my God! I was just there like a week ago. Were you really? Yeah, I was doing a gig up in uh, Peekskill. No shit. I had a rental car. I was going all over the New England. Yeah. And I'm driving down the Hudson. And I'm thinking, Sleepy Hollow. I wonder if that's a real Sleepy Hollow. Thing. Yeah. You know, Rip Van Winkle is there. Yeah. And uh, and so I drive in there, and I had lunch there. At some no cafe, shit. And I was going to drive down to um, um, Dobbs Ferry. Yeah. Dobbs Landing. Dobbs Ferry. Yeah. And then uh, I thought, now nah, i got to get to that club out in Long Island. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just veered off. and I. Tarrytown's nice, isn't it? Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really cute. It's yeah. quaint. Uh, I took a nap there. <laughs> I never woke up. <laughs> Don't take a nap. It's Sleepy Hollow, man. It's, you're risking it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the hotels have late checkouts in Tarry Town. <laughs> <laughs> There's your local joke for there it Sleepy is. Hollow. I did a joke. Uh, I forget where it was. It was like some ratty, like, outskirts of some town. It was like in a, it was a brewery in some warehouse, and there's a few hotels around. And I stayed at one. Uh, it was like a extended stay. Yeah. And I said to the audience, who would extend their stay around here? (laughs) 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 Ah, Local (laughs) stuff. Local stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, All right, let's get to the book. Let's start this thing, man. Listen, should I hit record? (laughs) Kevin Nealon has written a book before. That is true. You wrote a book. Before social media. That's right. Sold five copies. So hobbies, <laughs> and now this one's going to go big. I have a feeling. Uh, oh, by the way, do you know I, I gave you a big infomercial on the Joe Rogan experience? No, what did you do? I was on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, two weeks ago, and I brought up your book, and I had him pull up a bunch of the drawings on it. And I'm surprised you didn't hear about this. No, I did not hear about your it. Your publicist should be on top of this. And did stuff. you like it? I loved it. And did Rogan like it? The Rogan loved. It. He was freaking out. He was like, "I can't. I had no idea he was as good of an artist." Yeah. So um, it's. Uh, I knew he wasn't funny, but I didn't know he was a good artist. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he's been channeling his creativity. <laughs> um, so anyway so yeah I've, been, I've enjoyed it it's um i mean i've always enjoyed your instagram post and i guess that's how this started you just started twitter actually on twitter yeah oh uh, no it was instagram it was instagram i was okay. thinking of my hiking show <laughs> 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 yeah it was on uh, instagram i you know it was uh, maybe a year before the pandemic i love to do caricatures but i never really focused that that um much on them. you know i do sketches that take me maybe 15 minutes yeah. sketch. sometimes i wouldn't even color it in right and and then I started getting more and more focused on it, and I would start following other artists on Instagram. And these guys are really good. These are professional illustrators. They do covers of you know, Time Magazine and yeah. Mad Magazine. Right. And I, I was influenced by Mort oh, yeah. Drucker. Who was, the, who was the Mad Magazine Mort guy? Drucker. Yes. Yeah. And now I know these guys that do it now. Uh-huh. And... Um, and so I grew up reading Mad Magazine, and I love the caricatures in there. They look so much like the actors. And um, so that was a big influence on me, and also Al Hirschfeld. Sure. Hirschfeld. And, and, he did uh, all the uh, Broadway uh, actors. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And when I was on SNL, we had the table read, and sometimes I wasn't in a sketch most of the time. And <laughs> I, on, my, on the margins of my script, I would just draw whoever was sitting across from me, like Farley, or Spade, whoever it was, Carby. Yeah. And uh, and I kind of like doing that. And then on airplanes, I started sketching, because I used to have claustrophobia. Yeah. And if the airplane was stuck out on the tarmac for a while, I, I, I would start freaking out. So I realized that if I took out a sketch pad, or even a barf bag, <laughs> it was empty, preferably. <laughs> <laughs> and then it leaves room for people to review it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I would start sketching. It would take my mind off the plane being stuck. Wow. Or going through tunnels in New York, I would have a sketch pad and yeah. pen. And that would, so I started sketching people on airplanes, most of them with their mouths open sleeping. Yeah. And I never showed it to them. Yeah. And then I started. Never? Never. 
Never. I've never shown anybody my work. If they find it, well, not lately. I've shown some people because we had to get approval to use uh-huh. their pictures too. And somebody said, absolutely not. No kidding. I will tell you who it is. But they said, uh-huh. under no circumstances, don't, don't show this at all for promoting your book. But wait a minute. A caricature falls under fair use because you are using comedy. Buddy, I have gone through all of this with lawyers, copyright lawyers. and Get all out. Of and all of my illustrator friends go... This is ridiculous. Do this. This is all. This is all satire. This is that. You know. But you do a lot of them off of reference pictures. So if they look too similar to the reference picture, then the photographer can come after you, even if it's not the same. It's you know you don't want to go to court, so you pay the guy a settlement. Yeah. So Sean Penn would not let you. (laughs) No, I should have done Sean Penn though. But um, so yeah, I started doing people, and then I started following these people on Instagram who are amazing. And then this one guy was offering lessons. And I thought, you know, I'm never too old to learn. Maybe this will help me. So I took lessons from 10 lessons. I think it was 500 euros in, in England. <laughs> oh, you did it online? No, no. I would go there back and forth <laughs> once a week. <laughs> no, I did it online. Yeah, we Skyped. Yeah. We Skyped. This wow. before Zoom. And he taught me you know, some of the basics. But I had the And was the this, most... were you writing, was it, because I know you write on a screen, so were you able to write in real time and he could look at it or you would... Yeah, 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 yeah. He would see it. He would see it. Yeah. And um, he would tell me what was wrong with it and what I could improve. Yeah. But now it's crazy because I'll be walking around. I'll look at people. I'm not seeing them for what they really are. I see their exaggeration. And I see... It's like walking in a fun house. All these people like that are, look like caricatures. Right. And I really love doing it. I mean, this was... I, there's, so I have probably, to ask you, what do you see when I you're looking at me? I knew you would ask me that. I, well? There's not one I could pick out. There's just too many. <laughs> well, I would see... You have a kind of a small head. Uh-huh. David Brenner used to do a joke. He would say, this guy had such a small... It's same as Ray Romano. This guy had such a small head. When he was standing next to you, it looked like he was in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> he looked far away. <laughs> he used to have this joke. He goes, uh, I, I, I get on the subway and this guy's sitting on the, on the New York Post. And I said, excuse me, sir, are you reading that? And he looked me dead in the eye and he goes, yes. And then he stood up and he turned the page and he sat back down again. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a train is the best. You come up with the best material on train. Yeah. And this is actually word for word true. I was going from Rhode Island to New York, Grand Central Station. Three hour train ride. Yeah. And as I'm getting off, this woman comes up to me. She goes, are you Kevin Nealon? I said, yeah. She goes, I thought so. Oh, my God. I was watching you the whole train ride, and you just kept looking like you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So finish my yeah, portrait. Yeah. So anyway, oh, so you're, um, so the characteristics, well, you have a small head. You look like you're way <laughs> far away. You have, your ears stick out a little bit. Uh-huh. You have glasses. Uh, you have a smile with just a little gap between the front. We make that a big gap, though. Yeah. And you have a, a cleft in your chin. Mm-hmm. And your chin kind of juts out a little bit. Yeah. I like doing the three-quarter angle. Yeah. Instead of the profile. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. Right. See, that shows a lot more in you. I do, you know, the, the smooth, round head. You got some wrinkles up here. Not bad, though. Mm. And um, I see, I also see some tooth, tooth decay in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't get that close. <laughs> it, it turns out I have cancer. You read it. You have brain cancer. <laughs> You've got this gift. It's a curse and a gift. <laughs> so going back to these paintings, a lot of people haven't seen them until recently, or I had to get approval. Yeah. And everybody was pretty good about it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So so as I'm getting closer to the book, people people like it, you know, and. Um, and then I remember one time, Jimmy Kimmel, who likes my drugs, he had a, uh, Rami Malek as a guest. And that's one of the... That's one I of did. my favorite Is ones really? in the book. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's just the tones that you use that you really capture them. Thanks. So, second segment of the show, he goes... I want to show you something. This is um, a, a painting that Kevin Nealon did of you. And I thought, I'd just get your reaction. He takes it and he holds <laughs> it up. He had to print it out. And Rami Malek looked at it. He goes... And Jimmy goes, what do you think of it? And he looked at it for a few seconds. He goes, Kevin Nealon is no longer my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I never met the guy. you know. <laughs> but, but I think it's, you know, I look at caricatures of me, and there's nothing you don't know that yeah. they're drawing. I know I got a big forehead. Yeah. You know, this big gap under my nose. Right. You know, dark eyebrows. 
Right. Huge genitals. I know all that. Huge know? genitals. I, did I say And that? that comes up in a headshot. <laughs> yes. Wow. Just the confidence. <laughs> <It comes up>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so. He's got a double chin. No, that's not a second chin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I do, you know, I show people, I showed Steve Martin his. And he smiled. He goes, yeah, that, that, that's good. That's good. I like that. Mm-hmm. And that, Letterman loved his. I mean, I got the big beard on him. Yeah. Um, Brad Paisley loved his. Um, some people. Brad are Paisley. When I, uh, I was at your 60th birthday party and Brad Paisley showed up and he played. He was not invited, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up, and I got to be honest, I didn't really know. I'd heard his name, obviously. He's one of the biggest country music stars in the world, but I didn't really know him. <clears throat> and he played the funniest fucking song, and you have the lyrics in the book, and I forgot how funny it was. But he also then wailed on his guitar, and I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And I've since gotten really into him. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And, cool. and you spent uh, some of the pandemic with him. Three months on his farm down in Tennessee. And how did that happen? And that wasn't the plan. You just it went wasn't to- the plan. Let me just say this. That song he wrote, though, he wrote from Santa Barbara down to L.A., and his wife was writing it down as he was. No kidding, yeah. really? Yeah, he put a lot of work into it. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So during the pandemic, my family goes down to Nashville because my in-laws live there. Mm. We rent an Airbnb, and we're planning on staying for maybe a week or two. And then we hear that the pandemic is really bad in L.A. Why go back there? So we decided to stay in L.A. And Brad and uh, his wife Kimberly Williams invited us to stay on the farm, which we stayed there before, because. Our sons are really like brothers. Oh, wow. We went to the same birthing classes together at Brad's house a long time ago. And they're 15 now, almost 16. So they love hanging out. And then my wife and Kimberly Williams, his wife, are the best friends. And Brad and I, yeah, we're all right. You know, we're, all right. <laughs> no, we're good friends, too. <laughs> so it was just like everything worked out. They had a separate house we stayed in, so we had no, our privacy. And, 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 you know, a couple weeks go by. You know, we said, well, should we go? And no, stay. You know, stay. Why don't you stay some longer? Okay, stay. Turned out to be three months. Three months. Three months. And this was all. You know, in the South, that's just being polite. They didn't mean it. No. <laughs> well, that's true because Brad was the one that instigated. You should stay. You should stay yeah, here. Yeah, you know, yeah. why go back? It was yeah. really like, really, because he wanted all the, everybody to be happy. Uh-huh. You know? So, and now when he's like doing stuff, whether it's about my book or talking about us he goes oh man they came they stayed three months uh, be careful if you invite them to the place they're gonna stay for three months I'm like you guys invited us <laughs> now does that mean you guys were eating like three meals a day together well we weren't always eating together but we get takeout and groceries would come we wipe them down everything had to be wiped yeah, down of course right. but we did eat a lot of meals together I, yeah. I go in and get takeout from the curb the restaurant would bring it out uh-huh. and then you you know you have to kill the person that brought it out so you didn't catch anything <laughs> <laughs> that's how so many people died during COVID it was the delivery guys getting sacrificed but that was a great three months I mean yeah. during a wow. COVID if you could find if you could like pod with people that you knew that you're all free of COVID yeah I mean, that was ideal. So what was a day in the life? Were you doing a lot of your drawings then? I did a lot of the drawings. And he was playing music. There, and Played music. I did a, a, a duet with him that's on my Instagram. We did a, a Christmas song together. Uh-huh. Uh, and he played, the, you know, we both played the guitar together. He was upstairs. His studio was upstairs in the house we were staying at. It's uh-huh. a very really old farmhouse, the original farmhouse on the property. And I love that's my favorite house. It's got a front porch. You could sit out there on the glider and just play the banjo or the guitar. Nice. And you look out on the, uh, the, the, you know, the pastures and the trees. And there's a little graveyard right across with the original owners. They're buried there. I can't even read their names because the gravestone is all weathered out. Uh, and, uh, and he would go upstairs to his studio. And I would hear him a little bit up there. And I would hear him writing songs that a year later were playing on the radio. No kidding. And I think, where do I know this song from? Where do I know this song from? But yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Wow. So I want to ask you about some of the other uh, pictures. Draw, drawings, paintings, pictures. I guess they start as drawings and then you, yeah. then you paint them. It's a process. It's, it's um, multimedia. Yeah. Um, there were some of the ones that I loved. Uh, now, a lot of these are digital art, you know, on, on a Wacom. So you've got a stylist that draws a, exactly, on the screen. A stylist, 
and you have paint you pick from, different brushes you pick from, and then you draw on there. Interesting. And the guy in England, 70% of our time was him trying to explain to me how to work that thing. Yeah. And apparently it's the it's the trend now, digital art. Uh-huh. Uh, but that, then there's a lot of drawings in there, too. Did you make NFTs out of any of this? Looking into that now. Yeah. It's incredible. The I, I don't understand it, but it seems to be taking hold. I had to sit down with two or three people to help them explain it to me. Yeah. And I think I finally got a grip on it. Yeah, you should make NFTs out of all of them. They uh, like the uh, the one guy, in, is actually an American in Paris, said uh, he does all that stuff. He goes, send me um, three or four of the evolution uh, paintings you did that, that kind of I put in my uh, Instagram and in the book, too, how I got to the end point. Yeah. Start from the beginning. And because I'm not like a real seasoned illustrator, some of these people, they show you time lapse when they're drawing on their Instagram. One shot, one deal. They do everything, and yeah. it's done. It's like the yeah. people in the, at the fairs, you know, they do it. Me, I start with the eyes. They're not right. Then I do another picture and another one, another one. Sometimes it's like when I draw myself, probably took two months in hotels, and I just couldn't get it right. I wasn't happy with it. And I started and stopped so many times, and I did one it took me a month and a half, and I threw it away because I wasn't happy with it. No and then I did kidding. another one that took me maybe five days. Wow. And when I well, five you, days, you nailed it. I love your... It's the last one in the book is your, yourself. Thanks. My son saw it. He goes, Dad, this is the best one. This is the it kind of is. I said, did you see the other ones? Did you see? <laughs> 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 it's have like, you done one of him? No. It's hard to do kids because they don't really have a lot of outstanding features. <laughs> but I said to my son, you know, he's wa- he, he goes on YouTube and he watches some of the SNL stuff these yeah. days. And I see him watching all the like Kate McKinney and stuff, all the stuff that's local, you know, that's current. And I said, you ever check out like when I was on there from, you know, my generation? Yeah. He goes, no, not really. I said, well, let me show you a couple of my favorite sketches. And I'm showing it to him. And he's like, OK, OK. <laughs> And I'm watching them thinking, wow, these are really long. <laughs> these are long sketches. <laughs> I said, okay, I get it, Bobby. Go back to 2021 or 22. <laughs> yeah, the attention span has changed. Oh, yeah. It's really crazy. When I, I've noticed the same thing with my kids. It's, if it doesn't make you laugh right away, they're not interested. They don't want to know. Yeah. They don't want to know. It's, they're really impatient with everything. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, the James Taylor one was very cool because uh, I forgot James Taylor even looked like that. It was such an old picture it of him. Old. It was the first time I saw him, he looked like that. Yeah. So so you saw him and you were a fan. Uh, you went to, you've seen him how many times? Like 20 times? I didn't count, but probably more than that. Maybe yeah. 25 times yeah. in my life. And oh my God, I was the hugest fan. Yeah. I would, I played the guitar back then. I took lessons when I was 10. And then he came around, and I just I just loved his guitar playing with the finger picking and the bass. He was playing bass with his thumb on the mm-hmm. same guitar as he was picking. Yeah. And his voice was just so buttery and mellow. And I thought, man, I love. And I saw him in concert the first time, and I was just hooked. Yeah. And I was I was like, I was not a stalker, but I just idolized him. I thought this guy's the best, and yeah. he's got all this background with the heroin use. Uh-huh. And I would see him so, and I go through all the phases with him from Gorilla to you know, Fire, the whole like different albums, different times, One Man Dog. And I would go to, I remember I went to see him in Tanglewood, Massachusetts. That's the pl- I mean, if you can see him, it's like seeing the dead in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember his tour bus pulled up, and this was during the, uh, his album called Gorilla. Uh-huh. He wore a white suit on the album, and he gets off of that bus. And he's wearing a white suit. At first, I thought, was that Steve Martin? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. And it was James Taylor. And he had the long hair. And he looked just yeah. like with a mustache. Uh-huh. And I was so intimidated by him. My heart started pounding. And I just, I couldn't even go near him. Yeah. I couldn't go near him. And he played. And since then, I've seen him in so many concerts. And then when I get on SNL, they have all these bands coming through. Bands that I grew up listening to. All right. Like, you know, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger. Um, Aerosmith, you know, even Roy Orbison came through. And James Taylor comes in one week with Steve Martin, two of my biggest idols, right, in the music and comedy world. Yeah. And I end up starting to talk to James Taylor. And he's out by the craft service table where they have the food and uh-huh. snacks. And he's standing there, and I'm saying, James, you got to try these donuts. They're really good. And I'm shaking like it's a beautiful woman or something <laughs> next to me. And he goes, yeah, I'll, I'll, they, they are good. I've had two already. you know. And, uh, and we start talking. I said, James, let me ask you something. When you make that chord 
on Carp or whatever it was, Woman's Gotta Have It, some song, Secret of Life. He goes, are you using your pinky too to reach down to that fifth string? He goes, yeah, I, I am. I said, ah, oh, damn, that's a tough reach for me. But I was trying, I would have records. I'd yeah. drop the needle on, try to find exact point and try to emulate what he was doing. He must nope, have loved that though because he's used to being asked the same five questions all the time. And what then kind of hear, heroin did you use? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Who died in fire yeah. and rain? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That is women. Or Caroline in my mind. <clears throat> so then um, we started talking for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me, COVID. And uh, <laughs> and after a while, he said, well, you know, we should get together sometime. And I said, that'd be great. He goes, you know, Crazy. I say that a lot, but uh, I, re- I really mean it this time. <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, you said a lot to me before. <clears throat> that one was COVID. <laughs> and so he gave me his phone number. I gave him mine. And we arranged to go... Um, um, to have dinner one uh-huh. night. And um, we had dinner at some Cuban restaurant. And it was great. It was like going out on a date with him. Was it, was it casual or did yeah, you feel casual. nervous the whole time? I picked him up at his apartment. I took the elevator up. It opened uh-huh. up to his apartment. He was yeah. holding a little dog there. He was ready to go. And yeah. we walked down Broadway to this Cuban restaurant. And... Um, and we talked. I don't remember what we talked about, but I'm not a fan of Cuban food. I sweat like a, you know, like a, uh, I was going to say a pig, but I don't think pigs sweat. Yeah. And uh, I just, and we just chatted and I walked him back and it was like a date. I'm thinking, yeah. so do I hug him when we get up there? I'm not going to kiss him. <laughs> you know, we say we should do this again. But anyway, after that, <clears throat> you know, I go to his concerts, I'd be backstage. He even called me to ask me to do, to videotape the process of making an album in Martha's Vineyard. No the practice, kidding. The rehearsal. Yeah, I said, are you kidding me? So I come out there with my video camera and my wife. It's a big video camera back then. And I interview his mother. Uh, I'm filming him. He rents a little cottage next to ours because he's doing construction in his house. He comes over. He puts a set list out on the table, all the index cards of every song yeah. he's going to do at the next concert. Wow. He's, wait, wait, how do you, how's this lineup look? And I said, wow. Oh my God, what a treat. What a, I'm so flattered he's asking me. And I see the last card. <clears throat> and it's called Walk Down This Lonesome Road or Lonesome Road whatever it was called and I said James you may not want to end with that one and I'm thinking in terms of comedy you want to end big yeah. you know get them on their feet yeah. and he goes oh no I'm ending with that one <laughs> I said okay I'm not going <laughs> to give any more advice <laughs> but the best thing was he came into our cottage and he was missing he, had, he did our la- his laundry at our place because he didn't have a, a laundry machine at his house <laughs> his cottage so I said sure you can do your laundry here I'm like yeah you could, you could shower here whatever you want to do you could sleep here and uh, he does do you want to kiss me <laughs> you're still thinking about that <laughs> no yeah. and he does his laundry and he's folding his laundry and he's missing a sock and he goes I'm not sure what this is I said James did you check the, uh, the washing machine because sometimes it gets stuck on the top and he goes in and he checks he goes ah you're right I got it I was like so proud you know, I gave him some advice and it worked out. <laughs> that made up for the last Sinzex card thing. <clears throat> I'm surprised you don't want to keep that sock. You know, I that know. could have been. But, you know, I saw him a lot after that. Whenever he was performing in concert around here or in the East Coast, I, I'd see him. And um, But I introduced him to a friend of mine who was even a bigger fan than mine. And he glommed on to him. So bad, you know. He just he sees him like as a surrogate father now. Oh, really? Out, he stays at his house when he comes out. No kidding. I just, I just let him go. And you think that could have been me? I know it was you. Yeah. I know it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the other musician I want to ask you about was uh, cause I love Pearl Jam, and I guess when you were in San Diego, just starting. Yeah. Eddie Vedder used to come into the club. Eddie Vedder lived in San Diego. He told me this. Yeah. And I asked him if he went to a lot of concerts. He go, oh, yeah, I go to concerts. I was in one that was so jammed, and some guy got in a fight, and I got to, had to get out of there, and they got a knife, you know. And so I used to work at the Improv in, in Pacific Beach, San Diego. They had one a long time ago there. And he told me that he used to come to the Improv to see me perform. That's incredible. After he went surfing. He'd be surfing all day, then come there. And, and this uh, is before you were on SNL? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And I, and I was so flattered about that. Yeah. And then I come to find out years later that his girlfriend used to be a waitress there, a server. And that he was really going to oh, see so her. He's gonna, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, but I, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. So yeah. I'll that's still that. pretty cool. And then I remember he was on SNL three, I think three times on SNL, Pearl Jam and then him. And one day he asked me, what, what song should I do off my new album? Yeah, he's given me three. Lauren's given me three songs to do. Usually yeah. you get two. And I said, and I didn't know the album. Right. And I said, boy, Eddie, that's a good question, man. I mean, they're all good. They're all good. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. 
But I remember watching him. He has such a style. He's yeah. so good. He's really, he has just that soulful blend with his songs and playing. And But I remember he was spitting as he was singing. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. It would come out, the, the spit. You were that close. You could yeah. see it. Yeah. During the rehearsals, I guess. Yeah, he's, I know Judd did a, um, he had him do like the theme song for his last movie and he watched him create the song in a day in his studio and it was just like, yeah. he said it was just, an, an, oh, by the way, I, I took a walk with Judd this morning he did? and he told me that he's moderating your uh, book talk tonight. Yeah, tonight. Yeah. Yeah, live talks. Oh, That'll be good. Yeah, it'll be great. He's like, what are you going to ask him? I'm like, I'm not telling you what I'm going to ask him. <laughs> he called me and asked what I should ask him. <laughs> he should ask me. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> um, the other one I want to ask you about was obviously the guy who was very close to you and to Judd mm -hmm. was <clears throat> Gary Shanling. Yeah. And uh, he was complicated. And I like that you borrowed a little bit from your what you, you spoke about him at his memorial. Yeah, that's right. Which, which was just, it's one of those things that as a comedian, you know, we make people laugh, but there's certain times where, and I'm not one of those people like, I just do it to see the joy on people's faces. And I just like to know at the end of my life that I'm not, I'm not like that. But when you can go up at a memorial and take a group of people that's feeling intense sadness and make them laugh, like that's a real gift. And what you did at Gary's was about as good as somebody can do that. Oh, thank you. And so you borrowed from that a little bit in the book and uh, printed some of that. But, yeah. but I liked that it. it was so honest. You talked about that he was a difficult person. He was difficult. He was complicated. He was persnickety. I remember that. And he'd have ups and downs. You never knew. Sometimes I wouldn't hear from him for a couple months. Yeah. I would think, oh, he's probably in Hawaii. He used to go to Hawaii a lot. But no, he would just, I don't know if he just would, you know, be uh, wanted to be alone or what. And, um, and we played basketball at his house every Sunday. Yeah, that game went for a while, right? Oh, God, That yeah. Sunday every, game? Every Sunday, yeah. And, and the amount of people that showed up there. It's uh -huh. like a talk show. I said, Gary, who do we have on the court this week? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, we got Brad Pitt coming today. Yeah, yeah. Tom Petty. Tom yeah. Petty came to one. I have his, yeah. his uh, art in there, too. He came, and he would just sit on the bench um, by the court. He wouldn't play, of course. Uh -huh. Gary knew him from uh, Larry Sanders. Yeah. And he would. He was a chain smoker. He'd even have one lit in the other hand as a backup <laughs> for the first one. And I remember he crossed his legs, and... It seemed to me like he was braiding his legs. He got one leg around one so many times. He just had thin legs. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. And uh, that was interesting. But yeah, Gary was a good friend and a mentor to me. And uh, it was tough to see him go so sudden. Yeah, it seems like he was somebody that, um, as a creative person, like people talk to, and he just was very supportive. And I think he he had like. Um, just just in talking to Judd about it, it sounds like he would draw you out. He would he would make you um, he would challenge you, but also he said there was something very zen like like Judd would say to him, "I can't figure out the end of this." Blah blah, and Gary would just go, "You're gonna figure it out." And, <laughs> and Judd said, "And my shoulders would fall, and I would just go like, okay, 'Okay, I'm gonna figure it out.'" Yeah. yeah, I remember telling him once. I said, "Gary, I, I you know I used to do stand up because I I had a lot of." excitement about my future. I think I'm going to build and build. I'll be doing, you know, arenas and big theaters. And now I'm kind of at that point where I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, I'm just, I don't know that that's going to happen for me. He goes, why, why wouldn't it happen? That could still happen. I think, you think so? He goes, yeah. And that's about five years ago. It hasn't happened yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he's gone, so he'll never know. <laughs> yeah. But he was, he was a great friend. He was a great friend. And, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, that, that memorial, it was a real cathartic process for me because they had it a month after he died. And I remember being on the road on airplanes and I'd be listening to music that was very emotional. And it made me think about Gary and the, the parts of him that I loved. And even the parts that were difficult to be with. Yeah. I even said in that, you know, the book that he's, you, you had insight that he was difficult because he spelled his name with two R's. Right. You know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he sure was. And I, I could picture his face. I didn't even need a, a, pick, a reference picture for him mm. because I knew every feature. Really? I knew the big lips. Yeah. I knew the little broken blood vessels in his nose. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and that yeah, was... Yeah, that's one of your best also, that I one. Like that and one. Yeah, it's really... Uh, it, 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 there's something that, that shows that you had intimacy with him when you, yeah. when you look at that. 
Yeah, it, it was great. It, he was a good friend. I wish he could see that. Yeah, that painting. And then also, you talk about Norm Macdonald is similar. Like, um, and people talk about this that. You know, these aren't easy people to be around. They're geniuses, and they are, they're unicorns. You know, they're not like, they don't play by anybody else's rules. And it's not in a cocky, arrogant way, like, I'm smarter than you, I'm funnier than you, therefore I'm going to be difficult. It seemed more like Norm and Gary had such a specific and absolute worldview that they didn't back down from it. They weren't there to appease you. And people have a hard time being around people like that. They take life on their own terms. Yeah. And you have to accommodate them if you're going to hang out with them. Exactly. Exactly. And I think Gary was more like that than Norm. With Norm, Norm seemed to me like he always liked to put, you know, push triggers, the button, uh-huh. to get a reaction from you. Yeah. And Norm... We, I did his memorial, too. Seems to be my, my thing these days. Yeah, I saw you do that. That was amazing. And I remember how, and you heard this, I mean, people would say how brave his comedy was and courageous. And I said, I think it was just poor judgment. Because <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> he'd have people walking out on him. Right, you know? right. Uh, but yeah, Norm was, uh, and those are the people that you kind of remember as far as their personality and their their idiosyncrasies about doing that to you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it, there seems to be more and more people in that book that have passed away. Chris Farley. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all the other ones like Freddie Mercury. Right. Mm. But what's beautiful about the book is that it is, um, I think I started to say this to you before we started taping, is that it's the most beautiful form of name dropping because yeah, yeah. you've had a long, illustrious career and you have been somebody that has gotten to know some of the most interesting people in show business and you give re- really nice insights into it. And then the pictures show, there's like a love that comes through in the pictures. There's something about caricatures that is very that can be very... Um, uh, under, having an understanding of the character beyond phys- physically. You see something come through. Yeah, there is a lot of love in it because each one is a labor of love. I spent so much time on them and I look at every feature on that face of the mm-hmm. person and I know every feature of that face. And sometimes <laughs> I did an interview with some guy uh, a couple weeks ago from CBS uh, Saturday morning and they asked if I could draw him before he came. So I looked at three or four different pictures, and I did my best artwork on him. And then when he came, he looked a little different from the artwork. I said, no, 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 this isn't the guy. This is not the guy. Bring in the real guy. <laughs> that's tough. People put you on the spot with that. Well, that's why I won't do, I won't do commissions or, or things like that, because A, the person will either not be satisfied with it. Yeah. Or B, I don't know what to charge for a commission. Yeah. But I, I am having a showing, a gallery showing in Brentwood on December um, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. And I'm excited about that. I How much are the pictures going to go for? Well, the guy, the art dealer that I'm working with, he does he does Ron Wood, Grace Slick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen Ron Wood stuff up yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. So this guy takes me on, and he, he knows his stuff. So he took some of my stuff and he enlarged it four by four. The big. Nice. Big. I'll tell you something. That shows up all the little flaws yeah, in, the, in, the, yeah. in the art. And so I, before he does that, I said, I got to go back and fix some of these if we're going to expand it like that. Uh-huh. And so we're doing that. And, uh, and I think they'll have about 20 of those at this place. It's a small gallery. Yeah. And so, um, so I said, how much, how much do you charge for something like this four by four? Because it takes me like, like I said, it could be like three weeks, yeah. like five hours a day. So if I was like getting minimum wage, yeah, it would be a lot of money. Sure. And plus it's me, a big celebrity. Sure. <laughs> so he goes, um, I think we'll start off by like 7,500. And I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? He goes, yeah, I mean, that's, and it reminded me when I worked at the as bartender at the improv. This is back in 1980. Yeah. And Bud Freeman, the owner, was charging so much for like even a beer. Uh-huh. And I was embarrassed. Yeah. I would like, somebody would order a beer and they go, how much? I go, is 250 okay? You know, that was what they're asking. <laughs> 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 but he knows his stuff. So maybe that's, you know, if the person loves Howard Stern or Freddie Mercury or yeah. Gary, whoever. They or will you know. send any of these to the people that you did? Like, will you send Howard Stern his? Um, 
I sent, well, I was trying to get his permission uh-huh. to use his to, to on the talk shows and stuff. I, you know, I called, um, I called um, Bamba Bamba. Bowie. Oh, you did. Gary Delabonte. Yeah. And I said, um, Gary, you think you can get this picture to Howard and see if uh, he'd approve of, and you know, Howard. Which is, is the hardest thing in the oh, world. Yeah. yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'll, I'll get it to his people because, you know, Howard doesn't kind of deal with that stuff. And I said, okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate it, Gary. I never heard back. So that's that's a no to me. Yeah. Yeah. But I have heard back from a lot of people, like I said. Eddie but you Gunner. didn't get, per- but you, did you need permission to put it in the book? No. Oh. No. No. I mean, I had the lawyers and everything because it's changed enough from the original reference oh, picture. Okay. Yeah. So it is my, it is my uh, interpretation of that yeah. person. But yeah, I think if you're going to put it on T-shirts and stuff, you need to get yeah. licensed or something. I'm All not right. sure. But I yeah. love my Andy Kaufman on there. It'd be great on a T-shirt. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as far as the ones that would make good T-shirts, I would say Andy Kaufman. Um, I don't know. Tom Petty, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. The Tom Petty one's really good. The Robin Williams one would definitely sell. I got to tell you, I that one changed jumps the Robin off Williams. the page. I changed the Robin Williams because it's going to be a big and large one, and I had to go back and fix a few things. And I'll show you. Look at the version right there in the book, if you could find it. I'm not sure what page it's on, but this is the one I did of it um, to fix it up, and I think it came out a lot it's better. One of the early ones. Yes, yeah, the first one actually. Yeah. It's the first one, and come on. Yeah, it jumps off the it page. It jumps off, right? Yeah. And I love the hair on the chest. So great. Yeah, so here's the new one. You see all the hair coming out of the shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the body's a little better. Right, 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 body. right. Yeah. Yeah, that looks better. So I'm doing that with each of the ones they're using. I've got to go back and just fine tune them. Yeah. You know. That's fun to probably rather than starting it is touching it up is, is more fun is it like that because i know with writing it's like it's easier uh, yeah second draft yeah sure um all right one more i'll ask you about before we go um i wanted to ask about uh carrie fisher who's um you know somebody who i think had different chapters in her life totally yeah you know, a lot of chapters child actress and then uh you know an author i read her book uh, postcards oh, yeah. from the pink, pink. yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was compo- no postcards, postcards from, the, from edge the edge and, and re- pink, something pink reveal no surrender the pink surrender the pink yeah, yeah. And uh, my mom read her books, and so I ended up reading them. And uh, but but I mean, she really sounded like a really fascinating, compelling person. Like so she smart. just smart, and she enjoyed bringing people together. There, it was almost like a salon. Her her dinners would be like a real gathering oh of interesting God. people. It, it would be crazy. I think I saw Norman Mailer there once. Really? I, I mean, I saw everyone from Jane Fonda there to. George Lucas. Is that where you saw Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. Steve, yeah. I mean, uh, Alan, uh, that's the guy who did Microsoft. Uh, Paul Allen. Yeah. Was there. That's the kind of Harrison Ford. Yeah. Everybody would show up there and you wouldn't know who was going to be there. Uh huh. And I'm on the couch one, one night and I get up and I turn around and Elizabeth Taylor is sitting on the chair Jeez. right by the couch. <laughs> and it was that kind of atmosphere where you could go up and talk to anybody because mm-hmm. it was kind of like, it was just that kind of atmosphere and I said hey Liz how you doing she goes don't ask anybody over 70 how they're doing she goes oh my back is killing me now and the whole time I'm thinking I'm talking to yeah. Elizabeth Taylor yeah and I said oh you know my back goes out sometimes too I put ice you gotta ice it he goes oh I know about the ice I use frozen peas and I think really do you use one at a time or do you use the whole bag at once or and she goes I put it on there because they conform to your back or wherever you're using them and uh I thought, that's a great idea. So we chatted a little bit longer. And, and then I, you know, my back would go out a lot. And so I went out and I got some frozen peas. And I used the same bag of peas for like 10 years. <laughs> in my freezer, I'd have it. And I used it a lot. The label was worn off because I was using Ben Gay on the thing too, you know? And my mother-in-law comes over one day and she makes dinner. And I come into the kitchen on the table and I see peas. I said, where did, where'd you get the peas? 
And she goes, oh, in the oh, freezer. No. I said, no, that was my Elizabeth. <laughs> it was like my Wilson. That was my Elizabeth. And I should have known because they had a faint smell of mint to it, like from the Bengay. <laughs> Minty peas. <laughs> so, um, so those are, you know, just some of the stories from the book. Yeah. And they're all like fun stories for me, you know, starting off at the improv with yeah. Bob Freeman. Right. The, 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 the anxiety from all that. Mm. Um, yeah, I love all this stuff. Like, I mean, I think everyone's got a weak spot for hearing about the first time you did The Tonight Show and how you got Saturday Night Live. Like, those stories, I don't think anybody gets tired of hearing those because they're such, always like, they're just such big moments in your career. And it's it's personal. And it's like, yeah. it's really where dreams happen. Yeah. A lot of people ask me, this seems to be a common question, how, how, how did you get on Saturday Night Live? Although they phrase it more like this. How did you get on Saturday Night Live? How <laughs> did you get on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> how do I get that? You're getting yeah, that? that's right. Yeah. Well, anyway, people can get the book anywhere. It's available uh, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You, is it Noble or Nobles? Barnes & Noble. Yeah, that's what I always say. And anywhere, any mom and pop bookstore, too. You, yeah. You get it there. And, and um, yeah, there'll be signed copies from Book Soup. Oh, that's nice. Sure. And you can see there'll probably be some more book talks coming up. Uh, if people go to kevinnealan.com, you can uh, get all the information if you need it that way. Tour dates are coming up. He will be in Grand Rapids, Michigan, November 10th and 11th. Holland, Michigan, November 12th. Denver, uh, November 18th and 19th. San Francisco, November 25th and 26th. Lowell, Arkansas at the Grove, <laughs> December 2nd and 3rd. Wow. Aspen, Chicago, San Jose, Philly, Naples, all tickets available at KevinNealon.com. And the book, again, is called I Exaggerate. It's amazing. It is, uh, I mean, it's just, you're a renaissance man. I know you hate hearing that, but I was thinking about what your son, what, what kind of father you are, because when you can show your son that you can try new things and that you shouldn't be afraid and that you can, you know, whether you're playing banjo or doing stand up or acting like yeah. the fact that you can do so many different things, there's no better way to parent than to be that, you know, that, you know, vision for your child. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, learning is being influenced by somebody is learning by, um, you know, example. And I think when you show, you don't even have to tell your kid to do this. If you do it your way, like I, I'm a vegetarian. Mm. I eat fish now, but my wife is from Nashville and she never uh, was a vegetarian. Sure. And I never asked her to be a vegetarian, but she would see me eating vegetarian food and she just saw that and she goes, I'm going to become a vegetarian. Uh -huh. Right? So, um, yeah, so he sees it. My son sees it. And he's he's just really good at a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. He's really smart. He's kind, most yeah. of all. Yeah. But no, you, earlier you said I was a renaissance man. I think of it more as a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to take a break. And you know, <laughs> my hiking show, <laughs> when is this airing? Uh, it's going to air on the 24th. Okay, my hiking show comes out October 27th, the fourth season. I mean, the fourth, yeah, the seventh. Who are some of the names you got? Have you already recorded them all? Uh, most of them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, who do you got coming up? Paul Rudd. Oh, he's good. Eugene Levy. Nora nice. Jones, Greg Kinnear. Um, Ron Funches. Nice. Uh, who else? Uh, oh, gosh, I can't even remember all, all the... Uh, do, you have to oh. take, do you have to take shorter hikes if the guest is overweight? Uh, well, some guests are... are not in shape and I know the ones that are not in shape because they'll show up with a cup of coffee yeah yeah <laughs> but for me we started I started they were you know steep inclines uh -huh. this is like three years before the pandemic and I would get up those the next year it's a little less of an incline <laughs> a little less this year it's pretty much flat <laughs> Soon it'll be helicopter hiking yes. where they drop you at the top of the hill. <laughs> it'll be valleys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I'm excited about the book and I'm excited about the hiking show. Okay. Um, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Good thank hanging you, out Kevin. with you. It's always fun All seeing right. you. Another two Irishmen. Two Irishmen. One of us legal, the other one working on that's it. That's right. All right. All right. 